The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Hey, what is going on, guys? Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. Today is episode 126. The short story at the end of the episode is from 25 Perfect Days plus five more. That short story is 25th of December. It is not a Christmas story. It is not a happy story. Uh, there's a lot of death, but that's what I like. But more importantly, before we get to the story, I have a very special guest today, Gary Roberts from Good Dudes Grow, a podcast I was just on recently. He is a fighter that empowers through plants, health, and fitness. Uh, Gary, thank you so much for joining me today. Mark, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Awesome, man. Uh, no, I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, it, it's kind of, it's it's weird how the, the universe works because I think right before we talked, the day before I was talking to one of my firefighter friends about the same kind of stuff about how firefighters um, don't, will have a hard time, you know, dealing with emotions because they're, they're, they're taught just to, you know, just uh, hold it inside or as men, you know, especially as men, you know, we just keep it all inside. We're, we're, we're strong. We're tough. You know, uh, nothing's going to hurt us. We don't have emotional problems. Um, but when you think about it, when you, you know, I think so many civilians don't think about what firefighters experience in their job, you know? Um, so I was hoping to go a little bit into that and how, uh, one thing you mentioned, um, on another podcast was how, when you start as a firefighter, you know, what are your expectations? You know, what are you expecting you were going to see, you know, and, and how old were you when you got into firefighting? Well, yeah. So thank you for, again, thank you for having me on the show. And <clears throat> excuse me, basically I started late in my career at becoming a firefighter. So in other words, I started after September 11th, but I wanted a career where I could take care of my family and everything else. So I just said, you know what? I was a personal trainer. I, was, I had three different studios. And I says, you know, let's try something that I think I'd be great at because I help people all the time. So let's jump into the, the firefighting. And when I jumped into the firefighting at that time, I thought it was just breaking down doors and putting out fires and that was it. But no, to my surprise, I had to go through all this medical training from EMT to paramedic and found out that I'd be doing both and if you ever know what a paramedic does, it's basically a roving doctor. So think, think about a paramedic is basically we're the first line of basically medical care that happens to you before you get to the professional doctors that spent 7, 10, 20, you know, how many years in college to do that. So we got to make sure that you're 100% able to continue care through those doctors. So what we do first will dictate basically almost your outcome from what that doctor continues. Mm. So it, it was a completely mind blowing, blowing thing to myself. And I'm not a squeamish guy. I'm telling you, I'm, oh, I'm a, I was a thrill seeker. I was, I was a freestyle skier in Canada. I was a soccer player. I've broken more bones than needs to know at least once doing something stupid. Of course, you know, it's like, Hey, do this, jump off that cliff. All right, I'll go for it. So I'm not squeamish at all. And most firefighters are not. Listen, you got to run into a building while it's on fire, while everybody's running out. You're in the middle of a car crash with 80 people, with a bunch of people screaming at you while somebody's, you know, through a window or, or somebody's father dies and the whole family's around and they're all hysterical. You got to be calm, cool as a cucumber. And you got to take all those feelings and just say back there, let me do my job. And that's how firefighting has been, basically. We're type A personalities. You're not going to tell us to go get help. You're not going to tell us what to do. We're basically we're here to, to do stuff nobody else has done let's be honest and if you yeah. think about it think about this all the shows on tv that dictate firefighters what do you see you see basically a cool guy driving a big nice truck everybody loves him and then when they do something like pull somebody out of a fire you basically see what the television wants you to see is basically the person is almost 100 percent intact okay and basically now we're giving uh life-saving activities that's not how it works. Imagine something on fire. If you ever burn yourself on a stove, a house on fire is 800 to 1,000 degrees. What do you think a body inside that is doing? You ever put your, your face when you open the oven and you feel that steam come out and you get that steam burnt? Well, imagine that encapsulating your whole body. Basically, what's ended up happening, what we see 
and this is what I tell everybody on the podcast, is that what we see is when we go in there, we have protective equipment that protects us. We don't feel the heat. But those other people basically are basically melting themselves. Their shirts are melting under their skin. Their skin becomes kind of like gelatin so that when you're actually carrying them and pulling them out to safety to give what you see on TV, the medical care, that stuff is being pulled off their body, stuck to our, stuck to our gloves, stuck to our clothing, in our nose continuously. And that's only one call, just one. That's, that, that, that could go two or three more times throughout that, out, that, that ship because you're there for 24 hours. It's not like you do that one call and you go home. It's like that call can go from there to a baby drowning in a pool, to a guy that committed suicide but missed and blew half his face off, to a car accident. It, you never know what you're, what you're going to come to. And, and how do you deal with it? How do you think most guys deal with it? Because I'm sure, I'm, I'm guessing that's not something you come home and you tell your wife. You know, yeah. you, you, you probably, you know, and maybe my, my friend was saying, you know, sometimes they'll, ha they'll have a dark humor and, and that's kind of how they'll, you know, kind of deal with it. But, um, you know, what, how do you see people dealing with it and, and how did you deal with it? It's did it be causing problems? You know, I can't, I'll be honest. I'm part of my, my whole, my whole mission is actually to build a recovery facility and treat PTSD and everything else. I've never been actually evaluated, but I'll tell you, chances are, I probably would love to see what's going on in, in my own head because mm -hmm. there's, certain, there's a certain road we drive down every time to get back to the station. And there's this one building that my crew we've been on that we go past every time. And every time we say the same thing about that one call because it's where our individual it was during the um the housing market where it crashed the individual was it was a either a mortgage broker or, or or a banker lost everything and he went there one night and he hung himself well he lasted there all night long and he's i apologize to the audience for the graphic nature but his neck elongated to where he touched the ground wow so we every time we go that Fast that call. We have that, like you said, dark sense of humor. There's the giraffe call. There's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and it's constant every day in the back of your mind. You won't think about it until you drive by that building. So I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of other stuff that I see that'll happen that I don't know of. But how I coped with it is basically, you said, dark sense of humor. We, listen, I'm telling you right now, we'll go to a car accident where we peel somebody out of a car that's missing, or let's say a motorcycle accident that's missing a, a limb where we have to put the limb in a box. We'll go from there straight back to eating dinner. Like nothing wow. happened. That's like amazing. absolutely nothing happened. So we have the, this canny ability to hide that stuff, to push it back. And we don't want to say it out loud because in this industry, we were told this is your job. And, and that's where you got, we talked about it earlier. Nobody told us this was our job. Hmm. My example is, Let's say the military, you want to join the military. Well, you see all the movies, what goes on in the military. You know when you sign up, basically you're going to sign up for either two to four years to begin with, and you can continue your career after that. But for those four years, you may see combat, and there may be death and mayhem. You automatically know when you sign up. It, it, it's, it's a given thing. You hope you don't, but you know it's going to happen because you've seen it. It's been portrayed on TV. Us, we sign a employment agreement for 30, 20 to 30 years, never being told once that you will see death and mayhem every third day for the next 30 years guaranteed. Not four where you can say, okay, this is not for me. It's 30. Mm -hmm. And you want to make it to that so that you can have a good retirement. You want to make it to the end because that's the end goal of all firefighters. Get their career and make it to the end of the 20, 30 year career. And that's it. Nobody, there's very rare few. I know maybe one in my own that I know personally that says, okay, I can't do this. It sees the first accident and goes, it's not for me. Mm -hmm. Everybody else sucks it up and goes, I need to make it those 20. Now, something we touched on was the rate of suicide amongst firefighters. Um, is that higher than other professions? Have you... Have you experienced it? Do you, is it talked about in departments? It's starting to be talked about, but it's not, I'll say talked about it, It's, there's a poster on the wall saying you feel something called this number. It's not mm -hmm. talked about as it should be. For example, 
I think the last study I checked is anywhere between the thoughts of suicide in firefighters is about 46%. Almost wow. half the firefighters in the United States think about suicide at least one or more times throughout their career. Wow. Okay. And then I think it's about 20, don't I have to check the numbers, but 20 or 30% of that actually go through with it. Wow. So the number is high. And what ends up happening is that we don't talk about it. Let's say I get into an accident on the job from a fire. We ventilated the, the building wrong. The building collapsed and I get hurt or somebody dies. Well, what ends up happening? The fire, the National Fire Association does an investigation, spends millions of dollars to see what happens, reviews all the audio tapes, reviews all the, the radio calls, reviews everything, comes out with a game plan so that it doesn't happen again, and then provides training to every department throughout the nation of what going to happen and how to fix that. That's not done when, when a firefighter commits suicide. That's just, hey, somebody committed suicide. Call this number if you feel bad. Mm -hmm. it, the conversation needs to be a little bit more than that. And, and that's kind of like what my mission is through CBD in Canada is because what I've experienced through that in my own dilemmas and, and my own, how do you say, by providing my products to my firefighters, it was just, it was just magical to me how it, it benefited them just naturally without even asking. Okay. Can we go into that story? How did you, how did you get into CBD and cannabis? And if you could also kind of dispel some of the myths about what CBD is and why everyone should be able to use it. Uh, but yeah, if you go into that, how you came about it and, and why it's so important to you. Sure. I came about it because I'm an avid CrossFitter. I'm not young. I'm 50. I was competing. I was doing really well. I was becoming the, the top uh, athlete uh, in a, my age division. Every three, every year I was in a hundred or better athletes. So out of hundreds of thousands of people who participated, I was like 70, 50, you know, 20th, you know, percentile of the best of the best. So I, I, my grueling, my activity was grueling. It was, it was paceful. It was, you know, so you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And you know, as well as, as being a fighter, recovery is a big thing to do, not just working out, but the recovery is what you need to focus on. And as an older athlete, especially older athletes, that recovery becomes even more important. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We find better ways to recover, whether it's massages, better nutrition, and meditation, yoga. Well, I fell into the CBD saying, hey, listen, here's an opportunity that this product will actually lower inflammation and stop pain. Let me check this stuff out because right now I'm going through two Achilles tendonitis that I've had for over a year. I've seen every doctor, chiropractor, surgeon, and the last resort that they told me was we'll have to cut your fascia underneath your feet to loosen it. And I'm like, yeah, that don't seem too comfortable. So right now, CBD is looking like an awesome idea. <laughs> so I said, okay, my biggest problem is like, this is CBD. It's, it's in the world of CBD, this is, this is cannabis. Because mm -hmm. cannabis and CBD are both the same, all right? They tempt a, a lower THC level product. They, they named it hemp just to differentiate. So cannabis and hemp are the same product. The only difference is that cannabis has high THC. Hemp products has a 0.3% or less. Mm -hmm. okay. Being a firefighter, I get drug tested. There no, there's no THC whatsoever allowed. So I had to figure out, okay, well, I can't do either what's up and as my research showed there was isolate products and that's where i started investigating more and more of those products i ordered a bunch of them in florida when i ordered it there was no legalities it, it was still illegal they haven't passed the, their laws to actually accept it so i'd order it from california it came in little weird little ba bags and packages to make sure that nobody stops it or opens it i'll be honest man it tastes like shit it was the worst thing known to man it, it didn't do anything for me and i'm like you know, these articles is just somebody's trying to make a buck on the whole cannabis industry right now. Mm -hmm. You know, it just doesn't work. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I went to my holistic doctor. Where I take all my blood work and everything else. She goes, hey, listen, I'm going to a cannabis convention. Why don't you come? I'm like, listen, I already tried this. It's, you know, I can't smoke THC. It seems like that's the stuff I need. I can't do that. She goes, well, just come and see what they say. I'm like, all right. So I went there, I met this farmer, I met this group that have, they have a farm out in Colorado. They says, hey, we grow it outdoors during, only during, during growing season. Why don't you try our product? I'm like, yeah, I tried it. It doesn't work. He goes, just try it. They, I said, I took a sample, went home. At that time, my pain was an eight on a scale of 10 in my Achilles, both Achilles. So imagine doing that. Walk, it's like walking on glass 
with a gear of 80 pounds or more every third day, it, it just was excruciating. So anything would have been nice. So I took it, held it underneath my tongue for like 30, 60 seconds. 20 minutes went by and my pain went from an eight to a three. Oh, wow. In other words, the excruciating pain was no longer there, but I felt something. For those who have injuries, we know the difference between sharp pain to yeah, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, I went down to something's wrong and I'm standing in my kitchen. I'm like, I'm jumping up and down and my wife's looking at me and goes, what are you doing? I'm like, this stuff seems to work. She goes, you're an idiot. You're a complete moron because you'll buy anything under the sun just so you recover so you can go back working out. And I'm like, no, seriously. I'm like, I'm going to prove to you. So I went to the gym the next day. I started jumping rope, which is not a, not recommended. I'm telling you right now, don't, don't do that with Achilles tendonitis. Definitely not recommended. But the pain didn't get worse. And then slowly the pain went away. And I went, okay. So now not every CBD is made the same. There are people just looking to make a book. And there's other companies creating products that work. I dove into research. As I was diving into the research for recovery and pain, my daughter said she was addicted to pain medication and she wanted to go to rehab to get off of it. I'm like, okay, well, listen, this is this product here seems to help with pain. Maybe if we create a product, we could start giving her this and get her off the pain maze and kind of switch it. Well, before we were able to actually get a product to us viable and, and the way we wanted, because we wanted to make sure it was done right. We wanted to get it tested properly, everything else, because the last thing we do want to do is provide crappy products. She ended up passing away from an overdose. So th that dove me into why can't we just change the way addiction is being treated if we can just translate from treating addiction with more chemicals that are addicted to treating addiction with plant-based medicine. And so I dove into that mission and that whole mission started me up and I apologize if I'm ranting on. No. And then a couple of months, my mom called me and says, hey, listen, your father passed away. I went, okay. So I flew up to Canada, which where, where my parents lived. And I, I asked, I says, well, he, how did he pass away? She goes, I don't know. He passed away to sleep, yada, yada. We were cleaning out uh, his office. We found prescription for pain meds, mm -hmm. stacks of them. My dad was a printer. He used, to, he used to print for a living. He ended up being able to, with his home computer, print his own prescription to go get pain meds, which my mom was never, never knew about. So he was on pain meds and she never knew. And we, I assume that he took too many and then just his, his respiratory rate and everything else dropped and he passed away in his sleep without my mom, without my mom ever knowing. So that dove me even farther into this, this mission of this, you know, this is crazy. We have to stop this stuff. So that's where I finally created my product. I got it in and I'm like, okay. And I'm still a firefighter this time. It became legal in Florida, but yet as a firefighter, you're thinking I'm selling weed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to lose my job. You know, if, if they ask you, what is your second employment? They ask you, are you, you know, you're not supposed to do anything illegal or anything. And so I'm like, okay, so I won't tell anybody. As I'm not telling anybody, I started taking it. I started bringing it to work. They're like, what are you taking? Some few guys had injuries. I'm like, dude, you guys got to try this stuff. I'm like, this, I'm telling you right now, the pain and, and I mean, sleep. We have terrible sleep. That's mm -hmm. our sleep cycles are completely screwed. That's usually if you've done some studies and understand our sleep cycles will lead to depression, lead, lead to, to everything else, and then PTSD. And then that's where I think I thought the suicide was coming from. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, that's a whole different road we can investigate now. But I gave my, I remember I gave my first product. I sold my first product to a firefighter and he called me three days later and he goes, dude, what'd you give me? And I'm like, oh, snap. What, what? What, what what happened? Did 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 you do you fail a drug test? Did you like I listen? I'm new to this. I'm making sure my product's good and, and legal and safe, and I get it tested so there's no THC. So when somebody just goes calls me and goes, "What'd you give me?" I'm like, "Okay, something bad went on." He goes, "Oh no no not nothing nothing." He goes he goes I, I haven't told anybody this, but uh, I'm getting a divorce. I really hated my being around my kids, and I had voices in my head that kept telling me stuff. That I didn't, that I couldn't get rid of. Three days on your CBD product, those voices started to quiet down, and I'm happier around my kids. And I went, "This is a Type A personality person. This, we we just don't relinquish this information for free. Mm -hmm. Hell, we have enough trouble going to see a psychiatrist or or somebody to actually talk about this stuff. And this guy just voluntarily told me." that I got him out of a situation that could have led down a road where he could have committed suicide or done something else dumb. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm like, what if this product actually lowers those barriers in the mind to actually allow a type A personality to freely express something? Mm-hmm. Now I'm on a, on a mission that I can help people with their pain, but automatically this may actually now have them look at that poster goes, call somebody if you're feeling something. They may actually call now mm-hmm. because those, 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 those walls or inhibitions are actually lowered. And, and I just, it, it kind of just blew my mind and says, okay, I, I have a two prong mission. One is to create plant-based medication that I could use in an addiction and in a plant based medication that I can help my firefighters with depression, sleep, and PTSD. Uh, let's go full throttle. Let's open the curtains to the fire department and step out and say, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm selling CBD. Here's the reason why I think we should have this conversation and we should start allowing the department to actually have access to this. And that's my basically long, but short story on how I got involved in CBD and, and where I'm headed from this point on. That's awesome. Now with CBD, is that something, would it, would it benefit someone to take it every day? Um, like, cause I have a lot of pain. I actually smoke weed every day. It helps with my sleep, but I've been thinking like I should probably, it would probably make sense to transition to CBD. Is it something that would be beneficial to have in your system all the time? Yes. Short answer. Yes. Long answer is CBD and the cannabis, like you said, that you smoke all the time are two different, they work on two different receptors. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. So the cannabis that you take is actually good for CB1 receptors where are in the brain or nerve pain. So in other words, if you have real bad back nerve pain, or if you have seizures, or if you have uh, fibromyalgia and stuff like that, that's going to help relieve those type, type of pain, the CB1 receptor. CB2 receptors are also in your brain, not as much as the CB1 because the CB1 works on the brain, but the CB2 goes throughout your body. It works on your muscular system, respiratory system, cardio system, lymphatic system. All your systems has a CB2 receptor. When you're born, what ends up happening is that all those systems are running optimal at 100% and basically on a level platform. As we get older and get injured, we got inflammation, take pills, kind of, and our body starts to kind of teeter saw alter it gets altered as we get older with the more injuries and the more medications we take what cbd what cbd does the hemp side cbd it actually does not do anything per se as a product in other words like say for example if you're deficient in vitamin d and your doctor gives you a vitamin d supplement that increases your vitamin d Mm -hmm. cbd doesn't do that in your body those cbd cb1 and cb2 receptors are called the endocannabinoid system And what your CBD does, it actually goes into that system and starts that system to recover itself. For example, knee pain. What causes knee pain? Basically, probably inflammation. Take some CBD. What ends up happening? It starts your body to repair itself. So the body goes and searches where that pain is and says, well, we got inflammation here. Let's lower the inflammation as we work on those CB2 receptors to cause the pain to diminish. So it does a two-prong effect naturally having your body do it by itself, not the product do it for you as, as most supplements, as they call it, do. So yeah, if you're going to take it on a daily basis, the more you take, the less you would have to take because as soon as you get to a level playing field where your body's working optimal, you don't need to take as much. In the beginning, you got to find that happy dose to actually be happy. And then it just becomes a, a maintenance stage because the CBD actually stays a little bit in your, your fat cells and everything else. So it's always in your system. Okay. Awesome. What is the name of your company? And cause I'm definitely going to order some, I'm going to, I'm going to order some and start doing it religiously. Um, where, where can we find it? And what is it called? Uh, you can go to uh, my company's name is pure body Zen. You can go to www.pbzcbd.com. Or if you go to my podcast website, which is gooddudesgrow.com, there's a link there also that will take you straight to the the CBD site either way. Okay, awesome. And now, are you still working as a firefighter? Are you doing both or is all your attention on your company now? I'm doing both because one of my biggest missions also is to allow firefighters access to legal hemp products, which does has T8, which does have a 0.3% THC in it. It doesn't mean that you're going to, they're going to get high, have any cycle effect at all, but that little extra THC is basically what you want. So basically 
there's three types of CBD products. There's a full spectrum, which is the complete plant, which THC and everything in it. Then there's a broad spectrum, which is the full plant with a little bit of tea with the THC taken out. And then there's an isolate, which is a small piece of the plant. Like anything, you would want to use the untouched version, which is basically the full plant that's just processed one time, put into a jar, basically kind of, you can actually grind up and completely drink it that way. That's basically what a full spectrum is. That is a more beneficial because all those cannabinoids, which is close to about 120 in that plant, plus the THC, all work together. And it gives a, an amazing better effect. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely what I'll do. And I, I've had this conversation with so many friends that are either uh, police officers, a uh, friend who's in ICE, you know, they have mental health issues, you know, tons of anxiety, tons of stress, tons of pain, and they can't, you know, their hands are tied. They, they don't want to lose their job because they did something that's illegal, which is yeah, it's so ridiculous. So I appreciate you out there and fighting this fight for the firefighters. And, you know, I think everyone, you know, all, all, all professions should have access to it, especially the ones that are going through so much and dealing with so much. So, right. Uh, the yeah, key, but... the key to those individuals is under, is finding a company that has a, a, a cause an isolate product will work great. Cause that's what we use for our firefighters. That's what I use with no THC. You're not going to pop a drug test or anything else. The problem with that is that you have to find a quality company that actually creates a product for the right reason. Like I said, in the beginning, a lot of people ended up just trying to make a, do a dollar. So mm -hmm. when they buy a product and they go to sell it, like your mom, pa, or your gas stations, and it says 0.3% to them, that's no THC because you're not getting high. As long mm -hmm. as you're not getting high to them, there's no THC. But that little minute piece of THC will make you fail a drug test. Mm -hmm. So you want a guy that says, hey, listen, I test my products. I have everything online that you can actually see the tests. I get tests from the... the I get tests from the farm, then I take those products and I get them retested to confirm those tests from the farm. And then you understand that those products are actually good. And there's very few of them out there. That's the bad part. Okay. Because one of the one key thing to, to do is make sure that you're also getting the proper CBD is make sure your bottle doesn't say dietary supplement on it. Okay. Yeah, because I've, I've, I've had that problem where I have tried CBD. I think I probably have had some good stuff. But other times where it's like, yeah, yeah, it didn't feel like it was doing much. And so I uh, stayed away from it. Now, how about um, how about the lotions or, or cream, CBD creams? Like, so if, if my knee is hurting, will that work? Or is it better just to ingest it and let the body do its own thing? Uh, like our cream, I'll be honest with you, our cream, within 20 minutes, it'll you'll see a drastic difference. Now, it'll reduce the pain. But I always tell everybody else you can do is a two prong effect. Like you can do the internal to help lower the inflammation that's causing the pain. But if it really, really hurts and you have a trouble sleeping, you can actually take a dab, put it on your knee, and in pretty much 20, 30 minutes, you're going to notice that that pain is gone. But will it lower inflammation? Probably not as good as taking it internally because it's got to go through all those layers of skin. And by the time it gets to that inflammation, it's not very potent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome, man. Well, I seriously appreciate this. I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, this has been awesome. Uh, you're doing great work. And uh, yeah, man, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And if anybody else needs uh, any information whatsoever, just reach out. Um, listen, I don't, even if you don't buy the products, I'm here to educate people so that they don't take the wrong products and get themselves in trouble. Yeah, that's awesome. And now your website again, uh, Good Dudes Grow is a podcast. And what was the, the pharmaceutical, the CBD site? PBZ cbd.com awesome i will put those in the links thanks again for coming on i really appreciate this and i hope you have an awesome day it's my pleasure mark you too buddy all right guys hope you enjoyed that conversation i know i did now it is story time 25 perfect days plus five more this short story is 25th of december only one left to go next week all right guys hope you enjoy it talk to you later peace Twenty fifth of December, December twenty fifth, twenty seventy six. John Langley stood perfectly still on the platform, afraid the cameras would home in on any nervous shifting. A woman asked him if he had the time, but John didn't trust himself to speak. He simply pointed at the screen overhead. The glass train was already three minutes late, but John was in no rush. He'd waited ten years for this, plotted and schemed, sacrificed almost everything. He'd lost his wife, most of his hair, 
and now, maybe even his son. It was hard to know what was real anymore. John had been living two lives for so long he questioned his every thought. Was it his or the other John's? He felt amorphous, fluid. He wondered if he even had a skeletal system. Tammy's death should have broken him. He still woke most mornings thinking she was in their bed. Then he'd remember the nights the controllers came, back when they were still made of flesh and blood. It was the one time John allowed himself to cry. The outside world only saw his stoic facade. They only saw the patriotic father who'd enrolled his son into the way training program the day after they'd killed his wife. Matthew did what he was told. He obeyed his father, promised to infiltrate the way. He vowed to die before revealing the secrets of the underground. It was a lot to ask of a young boy, but John was convinced it was the only way to end this, once and for all. The glass train pulled up, and the door hissed open. John filed in with the others and took his seat. They were heading to the City of Light for the new preacher's coronation. As a disciple, Matthew would be in the ceremony. He'd procured John's ticket, which he'd had encoded last month. It was the first pseudo-contact they'd had in over two years since the raid on the underground, which killed Nick and all the others. John still remembered them as children running around their house, shooting water pistols. Cyborg controllers patrolled the cars of the glass train. Their metal limbs glimmered, unlike the dull gray sky passing by above. Passengers stared at their laps, their wrists embedded with electric ticket codes. At a controller's mechanical request, a young woman offered her palm. John turned toward the rusted carnage of some dilapidated skyscraper. The crowds gathered in the streets, everyone moving toward a giant video screen. No one looked happy, but it wasn't every day the way offered a coronation. Citizens were required to celebrate. John looked ahead. The blanket of ash was coming to an end. He couldn't remember the last time he'd seen blue sky, except on TV. Tammy used to tell Matthew stories of the sparrows she saw as a little girl, how they'd take off into the never-ending blue. John had seen where Tammy grew up. He knew she was lying, but he loved to see Matthew's face light up when Tammy talked about clear rain. A controller reached for John's wrist and jerked him from his memory. John offered his palm, tried to calm his pulse. He had plasma charges strapped to his left leg a detonator sewn into the lining of his jacket. He needed to seem at ease. The controller scanned his flesh, then moved on to a guy in a purple jumpsuit two sizes too big. Towering gold spires sprouted in the distance, spikes radiating under the glittering sun. An old woman stared until tears streamed. Her husband held her close. It was as if they were just some couple, going on a picnic. John had seen the City of Light on the news, but a screen couldn't replicate this beauty. Fountains, monuments, statues of the preacher overlooking the square. A pond they passed actually had real ducks. Everything led to the seven towers, circling the cathedral of the way. Three hundred feet high, marble columns, Stained glass masterpieces, created on the backs of the people. John pictured the explosion, a billion flaming flecks floating and swirling into the brilliant blue sky. But the fantasy was interrupted by a gurgling gasp. The controller had its claw wrapped around a skinny guy's throat. The controller lifted him out of his seat, the guy's feet dangling like some dying marionette. Yo! The skinny guy croaked before the controller crushed his windpipe. The side door slid open, and the controller flung his body, but the wind whipped it back into the glass of the train. It cracked down onto the rails, feet and shins snapping, splattering the underside of the car bright red. John felt his eyes twitch. 
It lasted less than a second, but a man in a red uniform took notice. Everyone else focused on the bloody clump stuck to the bottom of the train, but this guy wouldn't take his eyes off John. John centered himself, thought only of the sunlight shining through the walls. He'd activated his neural blocking chip to keep his secret safe, but the man in red sensed something. John knew it was no time to crack. He offered a smile. Two kids mashed their faces against the glass as the cathedral came into full view. Majestic. Massive. Only John knew that like an iceberg, the true vastness existed below the surface. The Red Battalion. Hover tanks, plasma rockets, and enough cold fusion reactor rays to bring heaven crashing down in a fiery heap. The train pulled to the unloading deck, and John made sure to keep his distance from the red uniform. Still, he could tell he was being followed. Matthew was standing tall in his disciple cloak. John hurried over, and the man in the red uniform angled toward the walkway. Hello, Father. Matthew's face was expressionless, his eyes cold. Matthew? John said. He noticed a striking blonde with even better posture than his son. She flashed an odd smile, which unnerved John, but he bowed his head. Then this must be Jordan. Her brilliant blue eyes studied John's face. Hello, Father. I'm so glad we finally meet. Yes, it's long overdue. John had worried Jordan would be here. He'd hoped to have a few moments alone with his son. He gave Jordan a hug, surprised by her strength. We should hurry. Matthew said. I need to get you to your seats. He ushered them down the stairs, Jordan staying two feet behind them both. They joined the throng spiraling down the silver ramp and spilling out onto the esplanade, where the reflective pool stretched to the steps of the cathedral. But first they'd have to pass under the security archway, red lasers scanning each well-dressed citizen, the women wore hats that looked like postmodern sculptures of the solar system. The men wore angular suits that shimmered and sparkled in the sunny afternoon. An older woman told her husband she thought they were underdressed. John noticed another member of the rebellion walking with the crowd. John never made eye contact. They'd all said their final goodbyes during the pact. John squinted, wiped his sleeve across his forehead. He'd never been in such brightness. He looked over and realized Matthew was gone. He spun around twice but didn't see Matthew or Jordan anywhere. He tried to stand still, let others pass, but a controller was suddenly behind him, pushing. Toward the gates, toward the gates. John eyed the cyborg security guards at the archway. There was no way he'd make it through with the detonator and plasma charges. Five feet to the arch, the red laser sliced through a woman with incandescent glass horns sprouting from her blazing red hair. Three feet. Arms at your side, the cyborg guard announced. Step forward at a normal pace. The cyborg security guards were polished to a blinding sheen. They had plasma rifles, charged and ready to destroy. Two feet. Designer suits and dresses hands and leather gloves pressing against John, his back and elbows. Someone asked what was the holdup. John considered reaching into his jacket for the detonator. At least there'd be an explosion, a small strike for the rebellion. But someone shoved him forward. The archway and lasers were inches away. Once he triggered the alarm, he'd be mowed down along with all those around him. If he could hit the button... These people would belong to the cause, not simply slaughtered like lambs. John's fingers slipped inside his jacket and snaked around the detonator, his thumb sliding to the small metal button. He'd tested it last week in an abandoned, burned-out warehouse. He angled away from the guards and toward a woman in a light pink robe. Wrinkles spread out from her eyes and the corners of her lips. She reminded him of Tammy, the woman who had set this all in motion. Maybe he'd see her 
on the other side. His thumb, slick with sweat, started to slide off the button. A hand grabbed his shoulder. He tried to re-grip the detonator, but he saw the laser about to hit his chest. He's with me, a familiar voice said. Matthew brought John's hand out from his jacket and led him and Jordan from the archway. Two cyborgs blocked their path. All gas must be scanned. Matthew pointed at John's chest. His heart. The valves have telefiber connectors. John nodded. It's true. But this clearly meant little to the steel assassins. Luckily, a human controller approached. John couldn't remember the last time he was relieved to see a living controller. The way it made the transition because cyborgs stuck to protocol, never questioned orders, and suffered zero psychological effects. They couldn't be compromised. The human controller asked what the problem was. Matthew explained. The controller pulled out a D9 scanner and pointed it at John's heart. John breathed deeply, and the controller waved them through. They passed two gigantic screens overlooking the esplanade, where ticketless citizens could watch the coronation. John, Matthew, and Jordan entered the cathedral. A few of the disciples' assigned companions were gathered by a marble pillar. Jordan's face lit up as she walked over to greet them. Matthew pulled John to the side and reached into John's jacket. He pulled out the detonator, kept it hidden in his gloved fist. Metal crunched. His son's hand was no longer human. This is over, Matthew said. What? No. You're clearly incapable, and this is my call. John started to protest, to demand he change his mind. John was still his father, after all, but the look in Matthew's eyes said not to make a sound. This was no longer the little boy who used to beg Tammy for piggyback rides or for John to read him one more bedtime story. This was a man who buried more people than John would ever want to know. Is everything okay? Jordan asked. Yes, just help my father to a seat. As Matthew walked beneath the rows of golden statues, Jordan led John to one of the pews. He sat next to the aisle and felt like a fool. For months he'd wondered if his son had been compromised, if he'd been broken. But it was John who'd lost his edge, a useless old man, forcing back tears. Red light filtered through the stained glass windows. The black flying buttresses overhead looked more like the bars of a cage than painted oak. The guests, including the president and other world leaders, craned their necks as the choir boys took their places next to the altar. Their hands folded in prayer, their tiny bodies draped in golden robes, just like the one Matthew had worn all those years ago. The church was practically humming in anticipation. The preacher hadn't made a public appearance since his firstborn son died over a year ago. His health had deteriorated, and there were rumors he wouldn't be able to attend today's coronation. But then the organist pressed the first key, and the monstrous instrument with its gleaming crystal pipe slowly rose into the air above the altar and out over the pews. The choir's soft, angelic voices wove together like threads of the finest silk and soared through the rafters where microphones transmitted the glorious melody over the esplanade and into the homes and city squares around the globe. Floating cameras captured the procession of the disciples in their ceremonial red robes. Everyone stood and leaned to catch the first glimpse of the preacher and his son, Jeffrey, both dressed in glowing white robes with dark red stoles draped over their shoulders. The stoles were embroidered with the seven stars. As they started down the center aisle, Jeffrey, a chubby stump of a kid, held his chin high and nose even higher. He'd just turned 15 and looked like he was in a perpetual state of smelling spoiled meat. John kept his eyes on the cyborg surrounding the altar. 
The AR implant in his left cornea clicked down the seconds until the underground would have control of the electronic signatures. Every cyborg would be temporarily immobilized by a magnetic freeze. It would last five minutes, if they were lucky. The preacher had to tug Jeffrey to keep him from racing ahead. John figured the floating cameras were broadcasting with a soft filter to hide the walking corpse. The preacher's gray, wrinkled skin dripped from his cheeks and neck. The tall silver hat seemed to threaten the structural integrity of his spine. How easy it would be for John to wrap his hands around the pathetic neck and crush his windpipe. Wasn't that the entire reason he was here? The preacher was only ten feet away and getting closer. How could John allow the last ten years to just pass by? His son, Matthew, had lost all innocence, not to mention a hand. And they'd both lost Tammy. All because of this vile zealot. John reached into his pants pocket and ran his thumbnail along the seam. He'd hidden a second detonator, even though he knew he'd never have time to use it if the first one failed. He never imagined Matthew would have taken it away. A cherub-faced choir boy stepped to the center of the altar. His falsetto carved through the cathedral as John drove his thumb through the stitching. He heard the thread pop as he fumbled for the button. The preacher turned and looked right at John, who didn't understand why until a blinding pain shot through his neck. Jordan was suddenly on top of John, his face smashed against the pew. He heard the congregation shuffling before a buzz rippled through his body and everything went dark. Heels clicked against concrete. It grew louder, then soft, loud, and then soft. Someone was pacing. John struggled to open his eyes. A single naked bulb hung from the ceiling. The stone walls were slick with blood. John figured it had to be his. He could taste it in his mouth. A blur flew toward his face and snapped his head back. John had been hit before, but he'd never been punched awake. The fist felt hard, too, almost like steel. John expected to see a cyborg. He didn't expect to see his son. Matthew walked over to the shiny blades hanging on the wall. Each weapon looked specially designed to inflict a unique brand of torture. The hatchet had tiny curled teeth on one end. John imagined one good swipe could rip off a man's back like a rabbit skin. Something was buzzing overhead. John couldn't tell if it was the light bulb or just his ears, but then he saw his reflection. It was one of the floating cameras from the cathedral. A child's voice squawked through the intercom. No, the one on the left. Matthew walked over and pulled down the club wrapped in barbed wire. Yes, exactly the voice said. Jeffrey, it seemed, was calling the shots. John was too weak to turn, but he figured the boy and his father were watching behind a one-way mirror, enjoying this like a perverse little play. Son slowly fillets dear old dad. In a strange way, John was grateful he was in Matthew's hands. If anyone deserved to do this, it was his son. Matthew swung and John tried to block the barbed wire club, but his wrists were handcuffed to the wooden chair. Something rattled in his mouth. He thought a piece of the club had broken off, but his tongue told him it was a tooth. The chair had spun, so John could see Jeffrey and the preacher sitting behind regular glass. Jordan standing beside them, a beautiful imperial guard. They had no reason to hide their faces. What surprised John was that there didn't seem to be any cyborgs with him. He wondered if the magnetic freeze had actually worked. Jeffrey was sitting in a high back chair, which rose twice his height. This pudgy child would soon be the most powerful ruler in the world, but at this moment, Jeffrey looked bored, scraping the armrest with his thumbnail. 
John wondered how long he'd been down here. Matthew rubbed his shoulder, clearly sore from pummeling his father. John spat blood and the tooth out onto the floor. Matthew leaned against the wall. He said, I believe he's conscious. The fat little teenager stood. It's about time. Jeffrey started for the door, but the preacher grabbed his arm. Jeffrey shrugged off his father's pathetic grip, and the door buzzed open, the light switching from red to green. Jeffrey threw open the door and stormed into the little room splattered with globs of flesh and blood. Hit him again! Matthew looked at John with a silent apology before slamming the club against his father's bicep, the end of the club cracking hard on the armrest. Jeffrey giggled and stepped into John's line of sight. We're just getting started. Jeffrey looked up at the floating camera to address the world. This man has desecrated our sacred grounds. He has committed treason against our countries and against the way. As Jeffrey continued to rattle off the charges, John strained to lift his leg. Both were chained to the ground, but he stretched his fingers and finally felt his thigh. He knew the plasma charges weren't going to be there, but he had to try. Matthew swung again. The sound was awful, but strangely, John didn't feel the pain he expected, just a glancing thud on his arm. His body must have already gone into shock. Not even this man's son is willing to stand by this terrorist, Jeffrey said. Matthew swiveled his hips, extended his arms, and really stepped into the next crunching blow. John closed his eyes, braced for impact, but again, he mainly felt the vibration. Suddenly, his left arm can move quite freely. Matthew's last shot must have dislocated it or shattered every bone. It was the only explanation John could think of until he looked down and saw the wooden arm of the chair split in two. Matthew walked back over to the wall of the blades so John couldn't tell if his son realized what he'd done. Was it an accident, or was it something else entirely? John wasn't in a position to ask. Matthew placed a wooden mallet in Jeffrey's hand. What the hell is this? Give me a blade or those daggers, Jeffrey said. All in good time, Matthew said. You don't want to ruin the fun. Right. Jeffrey straightened his back for the camera, then took a solid whack on John's kneecap. John screamed in pain. The shock hadn't numbed him at all. Jeffrey shuffled about and taunted the old, broken man bleeding in the chair. Jeffrey told the camera to really watch the next one, then reared back with all of his weight before twisting and driving it into the next swing, eyes closed for the home run. John threw up his hand, caught the middle part of the mallet, and tried to jerk it away. Jeffrey's eyes popped open, and he frantically gripped his end, locking the two of them in a tug-of-war. Let go! Jeffrey grunted, his face as red as the stains on John's shirt. With both hands on the mallet, Jeffrey roared. Matthew's gloved hand shoved a plasma charge into that fat mouth. The belt came next, securing the charge. Jeffrey's fingers clawed at the metal strap wrapped around his head. He tried to pull it off, but Matthew laughed at him and kicked him to the ground. The room filled with the sound of muffled banging, the preacher pounding on the window, looking to Jordan for help. Matthew unlocked his father and helped him to his feet. It was the only way. John didn't think he could walk on his own, but then the light above the door buzzed green. Jordan held it open a small detonator in her outstretched hand. Father? The preacher screamed blasphemy, shouting for his guards. Jeffrey scrambled to his feet, fingernails sliding across the metal strap. John limped to Jordan and took the detonator, the floating camera following him and his children into the viewing room. 
the door shut behind them. The preacher faced John, his ridiculous hat on the floor, a wild glare in his eye. A cornered animal with nothing left. He lunged for the detonator and screamed, He's the chosen one! Although he was injured and old, a newfound power filled John. He collided with the preacher, smashed his face to the glass, John's bloody forearm crushing his neck. He's my son, the preacher struggled in vain, shouted again. He's to be a preacher. John pressed the button, the explosion shaking the room. The glass splattered red, cracked from shards. He's no more. The preacher fell to his knees, but John felt nothing for him. Matthew helped his father to the exit, but turned back to the camera and said, Citizens of the Americas, you are now free. Do with that what you will. In the hallway, Matthew checked John's injuries, apologized for not letting him know the change in plans. Jordan stepped from the viewing room, blood dripping from her hand. Come on, I have the access codes. John used his son for support and followed Jordan down a flight of stairs and another long hallway. There was a security keypad and retinal scanner. She punched in the code, then held a detached eyeball up to the screen. The light flashed blue. Jordan threw open the blast doors, and John saw the Red Battalion stockpile, the hover tanks, long-range thermal missiles, subsonic cannons, volcanic reactors, and the seemingly endless supply of plasma rifles, particle grenades, and P-3 charges, not to mention the 15,000 cyborgs. The Underground now had an army. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network. 